The topic of this presentation is understanding JSD to for B in uh, less than 30 minutes. Um, so it definitely won't be a complete guide to JSD to for B, um, but I will try to cover like the basics, the most important subjects. And, yeah. and if you're still interested into it, there are some like links at the end of the slide that you can follow. Uh, if you want to further dive into it. Uh, my name is Lars Peter Clausen. I work for Analog Devices. And so first introduction, what is GSD 2 for B? And it has been designed and it supports up to 32 lanes per link and each lane can transport uh, up to 12.5 gigabits per second of uh, raw data. Um, the actual useful payload is a little bit less because a little bit of protocol overhead uh, but overall you can get like uh, 40 gigabits per second, uh, 400 gigabits per second over one link which is quite a bit. And um, the standard, the JST24 base or JST24 standard, not only describes how to get bits from A to B, but it also assigns meaning uh, to the bits. It describes how, um, like, how to map a sample onto those high-speed lanes. This is all defined in the standard itself. Unlike, for example, if you are using converters using parallel LVDS. Um, there is no common standard how to map the data onto, onto the LVDS lines. And other things that the JST24 standard offers is uh, multi-chip synchronization. So if you have multiple chips, multiple ADCs, multiple DACs, and want to capture synchronized data or transmit synchronized data, the standard defines how to do this. So it is no longer chip uh, specific. And the other very important thing is deterministic latency. We will talk about this in more detail in a moment. Um, but it basically uh, allows you to make assumptions about how much time will elapse between when the conversion was done and when the data arrives at your logic processing device. Uh, quick timeline, so JST24 went through three revisions. Um, there was the first one in 2006 and it only had one lane and it was only running at 3.125 gigabits per second and people quickly figured out this is not enough. So um, in 2008 there was the first revision, jst 24 a and they added support for multiple lanes. Um, but bec uh, it became pretty apparent that it's still not enough so there was a second revision or third revision, jst 24 b which introduced uh, which raised the limit for each lane up to 12.5 gigabits per second. And if you kind of follow this timeline, uh, right about now should be um, time for the next standard. And um, there are actually devices shipping that go beyond what the standard has to offer and run at 15 gigabits per second per lane. Um, and I think there will also be a RFC at some point in the future soon. And the other important thing that uh, Jesse 2 for b introduced was the deterministic latency. There are two different, uh, three different subclasses, um, which, uh, so subclass 0 doesn't offer deterministic latency, and 1 and 2 basically have different methods for achieving deterministic latency. And it also introduced a more flexible clocking scheme. In uh, the previous iterations, you had to uh, supply the same clock at the same frequency to all the devices in the system. And with jesse 2 for b it's possible to run some of the clocks at um, harmonic or subharmonic frequencies. This means you can, um, the clock going to your converter might be tw twice as fast or four times as fast as the clock going to your FPGA. Because uh, let's say you have a converter running at one giga sample per second. Uh, you won't be able to um, run the logic in your FPGA at 1 gigahertz. So you maybe want to scale down, run it at 250 megahertz, and um, this was introduced by the standard. 
Um, so motivation, why do we actually need this? Um, especially for the software-defined radio stuff. Why do we care about JSC 2 And um, what we're seeing is that the increasing data demands, um, like a lot of, lot of the new mobile communication standards have rather wide channels. Um, Wi-Fi, the latest version, AC, has channels which can be up to 160 megahertz wide. Um, LTE supports uh, channel bundling or channel aggregation uh, up to 5 to 20 megahertz channels and to one logical 100 megahertz channel. And at the higher bands, like what's in discussion for 5G and also Wi-Fi AD, you got channels which are more than a giga, uh, gigahertz wide, like for example, um, for, for Wi-Fi AD, I believe it's like 2.6 giga hertz your channel so you have to kind of like capture all this data and um, get it somewhere and another trend we're seeing is um, the, the adoption of diversity transmitters and receivers and the most simplistic way this is um, kind of like MIMO where you're just using it to gain diversity gain um, which means you have multiple antennas which are placed in a certain specific pattern so you can receive the same signal multiple times and if one of the signals gets some kind of distortion you set things up so that the other one doesn't so you then can still recover your signal that you're sending um, but more and more wireless standards are actually uh, designing support for diversity into the standard itself like with uh, Wi-Fi AC you, there's kind of like provisions for measuring the channel and um, making, actually using the different multi-path uh, propagations of your signal as separate channels. And for this, of course, you need diversity transmitters and receivers. And for each transmitter and receiver you add to your system, you're going to double your data rate or increase your data rate. And the last trend that's becoming very important at the moment is uh, direct RF, which means you are no longer having your analog mixers where you're downmodulating your signal of interest, but you're capturing the whole spectrum up to your uh, signal of interest, like you capture 2 gigahertz, 4 gigahertz, maybe even more, like 10 gigahertz. Uh, at the same time and then do digital processing on it to extract your signal of interest and, uh, and for certain applications it is like gets, gets you better results than doing doing this in the analog part of your design. Um, so by, but why does it mean that we actually need something like Jesse to fill B? Why can't we just keep on and continue what we had before? And um, to like parallel buses and the issue with parallel buses is you can there are two ways to increase your data throughput either increase the number of pins or increase the uh, clock rate if you increase the number of pins you can send twice as much data if you double the clock rate you can send twice as much data um, more pins has the issue of, of routing um, so uh, if you like have 40 pins of even 60 pins it gets really complicated routing this all and you really have to kind of like hope that your receiver device has the same mapping um, as your transmitting device otherwise you have to kind of like uh, do a lot of you need a lot of layers to, to be able to route it and the other issue the more lanes you have is um, the more power you use so power becomes also uh, an issue at some point and the other thing is uh, if you increase the clock rate you are running into the issue that um, for, par for a parallel bus you need to capture all your data at the same time. Right? You have your clock and then you have your data. And both the clock has jitter, the data has jitter, there's skew between the clock and the data and all of these um, kind of like depend on different um, operating parameters they will change with the process with the voltage with the temperature and voltage here doesn't mean uh, kind of like yeah, at 1.8 and 3.3 you will get different propagation delays uh, it actually means that your power supply which has a uncertainty of like plus minus 10 percent um, even though it's set up for the same nominal voltage 
will introduce different skews and delays here. And um, the higher up you go with your clock frequency, the smaller this window will get and uh, eventually simply becomes impossible to, to match it. So, and this is where JST 204B or JST 204 comes into play and a quick overview of how such a system looks like. Um, you basically have four components. Um, there's the clock chip and the clock chip is connected to some kind of reference clock. And then the clock chip will typically contain a PLL and a couple of clock dividers. And the clock chip is responsible for generating all the clocks that are used inside your system. And it's also responsible for creating the so-called sysref signal, um, which is used for synchronization between multiple devices. And then up here you have your transmitter. Um, and on the other side, you have your receiver. And in between, there's a high-speed serial link. And as we discussed already, there can be up to 32 lanes. And there's one additional signal, the so-called SYNC signal, synchronization signal. And to establish a, a, a link, what the receiver does in the beginning, it, it pulls the SYNC signal down. And then the transmitter will send some kind of uh, synchronization sequence. And uh, once synchronization has been completed, the receiver has locked onto the signal that's being sent here. It will deassert the sync signal and the transmitter will start sending the data. Um, but in addition to this, the sync signal can also be used once the link has been established to do error reporting. So if something goes wrong, if the data is no longer good, if there are lots of errors, the receiver can assert the sync signal for one clock cycle to tell the receiver at uh, a transmitter that something's wrong and maybe it's time for a reinitialization of the link. Um, right, and there are two different classes of transmitters and receivers. There's the so-called converter devices and the logic devices. And the converter devices are your ADCs, DACs, and so on. And the logic device is uh, the processing. And um, in addition to this, as I said, JST not only defines the physical link layer, but it also does a lot of other stuff. And the standard defines four different layers. There's first of all the application layer, where all the application-specific uh, processing happens. And since this is application-specific, there's obviously nothing in the standard that says what needs to be done here. But what the standard defines is um, the interface between the application layer and the underlying layer, which is the transport layer. And what the transport layer does, it's responsible for the so-called sample framing and also lane mapping. This means it takes the raw sample data and packs it into, in a certain way that everybody agrees on, all JST 204B devices agree on, and then distributes this data um, onto the different lanes. And then the next layer is the linked layer, and the linked layer is per lane. So from the transport layer, the transport layer will pass so-called octets, which is eight bytes of data, or eight bits of, sorry, eight bits of data, to the linked layer, and the linked layer will do some, some processing, like scrambling, scramble the data, it will do the so-called character replacement, um, which we'll talk about in a moment, and it will also do 8B, 10B encoding. And then at the physical layer, we have really the high-speed serial uh, interface, and this typically involves the conversion from parallel data into serial data. And on the receiving side, you also do clock recovery. And often you also include signal shaping because at 12.5 gigabits per second, your transmission line is really transmission line. It's no longer uh, normal data. So uh, you need to do some signal shaping. And yeah, so let's talk about the converter device. The converter device, the two different kinds, there's the ADC device and the DAC device. And so first of all, a converter device can contain multiple converters. And um, typically in modern converter devices, in addition to just the data conversion, there's some kind of processing. And here is basically the split where the JST, JST layer starts. Uh, first of all, we got the framer, which works over all data and then distributes the data onto each lane. And typically, you also have a PLL in there to generate the clock um, for, for the high-speed serial link. And on the receiver side, on the DAC side, 
it's basically the same. You have one lane or you have your lane specific processing, then it goes into the D framer and the D framer distributes it to all the converters, to all the DACs. And what's important is that all those ADCs and DACs inside one device are all running synchronous. And logic device looks basically the same, like except that instead of having your converters here, you have huge block of custom processing. Um, and the one special thing about the logic device is that one logic device can actually interface to multiple converter devices. The so-called uh, multipoint link, for example, you need four ADCs, but your converter device only has two ADCs. So you can take two of those and combine them into one logical converter device, which has four ADCs. Um, then the link, so as I already said, the link consists of multiple independent lanes and um, on the, on the physical level, you use this differential current mode logic. It's kind of like LVDS, but a little bit more power to be able to handle the high speeds. And uh, it has an embedded clock rather than a separate clock. This way, you no longer have to deal with this clock and data matching. And um, as I said, it does the data scrambling. And the data scrambling is optional, but it's highly recommended because um, if you turn off data scrambling, you kind of like your data might contain certain patterns and this will result in certain spurs which will then show up in your actual data. So that's why the data scrambling should pretty much always be enabled. And also the CDR kind of expects data scrambling to be enabled. Uh, yeah. And um, a link or a lane has a couple of parameters. There are lots of them, even more than what's shown on this slide. Uh, I don't want to go into detail of all of them, um, but you can see there's a lot of lots of things which can be configured um, which tell the sender and the receiver how the data is sent over the link. Um, yeah, let's talk about deterministic latency quickly. So <clears throat> propagating data over a link takes time. Like you might have pipeline delay and also propagating a signal from A to B over your transmission line takes time. And this time or so part of this is fixed, you know how many uh, pipeline cycles you have, but part of this is also um, kind of like variable and depends on <coughs> manufacturing differences and environmental conditions. Again, process voltage temperature. And there are certain systems and algorithms that are very latency sensitive. Uh, for example, closed loop control system where you transmit something, then measure it, and then adopt your transmit uh, based on this like DPD and, there are, and also radar, where you want to measure the runtime difference between two signals, uh, very, is very uh, yeah, dependent on, on, on latency. So ideally, you always want to have the same latency. And the way JST does this, it does not remove the latency from the system, but it compensates for it. And the way this works, there's a so-called local multi-frame clock, which is kind of like a slower version of the frame clock, can be... Yeah, it's kind of like a local clock, uh, sorry, a slow clock generated inside the device. And all events that are, um, deal with synchronizing things are synchronized to this local multi-frame clock. And how it works is first the receiver asserts the sync pin. It asserts the sync pin, which means it's ready to receive data. Then the, on the next clock, the TX starts sending data. And it will take a little bit of time until the data reaches um, the receiver um, and there's also a certain amount of um, variance in how long it takes and the way Jesse makes sure that your latency is always the same it uses kind of like a FIFO and it delays the data until the release opportunity so it doesn't matter whether the data arrives here or here the first sample that will be released to the application layer will be at this release opportunity. Um, yeah. And for this to work, of course, your variance needs to be less than one local multi-frame clock. And let's quickly talk about data integrity. So um, 8B, 10B uh, allows some detection of a few simple errors, um, but not so many. And um, what the standard defines is if an error is detected, it should actually be replaced with the data of the previous frame. But what many um, 
implementations do is they just assert some kind of error signal, error flag, because um, from a processing point of view, it's better to know that you got an error rather than replacing your data with random data. Uh, but there's no additional data protection, like no CRC or forward error correction on the link itself. And if you look at what kind of data Jesse is actually transporting, um, so it's, it's not very like kind of like high fidelity. You have your DAC, which will do digital to analog conversion, which is a noisy process. On the receiver side, you have an ADC, which does analog to digital conversion, which has, is a noisy process. There's always background noise, which kind of like uh, affects your data. And then, of course, you all know the RF channel, and the RF channel is kind of like the worst thing. You have lots of interference that will uh, flip bits, destroy bits, whatever. And so what the Jesty link has to offer, or needs to offer, is just it needs to be better than all of this. The bits, bit flips that are introduced at this level need to be the noise floor of, of this part, because the upper layers will already know how to deal with certain kinds of, of errors. Um, we'll skip this. So, software support. Um, since JSD is kind of like a standard, you might expect there's a really great software infrastructure based on top of this, but the current situation is not so great, there's no common infrastructure, and typically the system integrator, the guy who puts together um, the converters and puts them onto this P PCB and maybe writes some software, needs to research all the constraints of all the different system components. Um, different converters, different logic devices have different constraints for these parameters that I showed before. And um, so you have to go into these data sheets and figure out uh, how does all of this work and find a configuration that works for all of them. And then you have to look up the magic register values that map to those settings and program them. And um, typically, the application developer, the software-defined radio person, has to work with what's provided from the system integrator. Because um, changing this is very, it's a big hassle. And, um, um, we're trying to change this with the development of the lib JST 204. And uh, the way it works, it has a built-in database of all the converter devices, logic devices, and so on. And um, all the constraints that are uh, imposed by those devices. And those rules, or this database is not kind of like a database with A, B, like this supports one lane, two lanes, and so on, but it's rather a database of uh, programmatic rules where you specify relationships. And, um, and then the system integrator only needs to specify in addition to the constraints that are already found in this database, constraints of his um, board. Like for example, a converter might support eight lanes, but only four lanes are wired up on a certain system. And um, then the application developer can dynamically change the configuration at runtime. For example, change the sample rate. And I think this ties in with the talk we've seen before. Because um, people want to get stuff done. They don't want to care about all this low-level stuff. They want to build a software-defined uh, radio applications. And hopefully, what this LibJSD 204 <coughs> will provide will be able to achieve this. And the other part the lib will do, it will automatically map a configuration to register settings. And that's it. Questions? Or um, yeah. Are there any open cores for interfacing with this on FPGA? Yeah, so there's um, <coughs> the M-Labs, um, open source implementation of the Jesse 204B core. Um, it's written in, in, in MyGen. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like a special language. It's like Python, maybe a little bit like my HDL, but uh, different. And <laughs> <laughs> they provide an open source core. And uh, let's see, <sighs> this one will also be available soon. It's something we've been working on. Um, it's yeah, the complete transmit and receive course implemented in the FPGA vendor independent way. And it will 
It's not quite ready yet, but it will in the next two weeks appear on our GitHub repository. So, yeah, that's the thing. One question over here. Have you tested the MLabs core with your chips? The what core? You, you just mentioned an MLabs core. I wasn't familiar with Oh, that. no. Uh, Have you tested it with your chips? I know that they're using our chips, yes. Can you repeat the question? Okay, so the question is, has the MLab core been tested with the ADI converters? And yes, it has been, uh, they are using the ADI converters. Is, is it an open source core? This one is open source, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned that when the, tra uh, the receiver deasserts the uh, sync uh, line, the transmitter sends some synchronization information. Mm -hmm. Does it also send information about what the uh, the configuration parameters are of the sample and such, is that contained in that uh, configuration or do you need to on the receiving side and the transmitting side both manually specify this is what I'm sending yeah. and the other side has to yeah, So there's a so-called initial lane alignment sequence and in this a lane alignment sequence you send the full configuration parameters over the link um, but typically you also program them on both sides but if you had hardware which supported this, you could do it this way. So typically there's a second channel for configuration using SPI or I2C. Any one question over here? Sorry, could you repeat? In case, for example, of a DAC. They don't have to write the clock itself. Yes, it could be, but uh, the standard explicitly forbids this. Sorry, the question is, can you use a recovered clock to run the device itself rather than distributing a separate clock to the device? Yes, you can, but then you don't get the deterministic, deterministic latency because your recovered clock will have kind of like random phase. Um, depending, because you have that, because you recover the high high rate clock and then you create a down divided clock for the parallel uh, section of your processing and the parallel sec the parallel clock will have random phase to your transmit parallel clock <laughs> no no we can talk about this later um, Sorry, last I think that's one more question if you have a short one <coughs> I think there was one over there. So, um, is the fixed latency mode mandatory in the standard, or is there also an uh, um, option for best effort mode or something like that? Uh, so the question is, if, if the latency is uh, mandatory in the standard, and the answer is no. Um, I mentioned this quickly in the beginning. There's three different subclasses. There's subclass zero. And subclass zero basically just says, uh, instead of having this release opportunity, um, just release the data when the last lane arrives. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.